Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to those of you um, in the lecture theatre in person, and also um, a special welcome to our online audience. I think that in this day and age, we should start by congratulating one another on the very act of getting together. This conference has been a long time in the planning, and it's very exciting to be able to say that it's finally happening. And I'm extremely grateful to everyone who's made this possible, especially our sponsors at the universities of Le Havre, Paris and Southampton, and of course, all the teams here at Churchill College. My name's Alan, Alan Packwood. I'm lucky enough to be the director of the Churchill Archive Center, and you're going to be meeting various of my colleagues over the course of the next two days. But I think a special thanks goes to my colleague, Amanda, um, who I see is just popping out of the door at the back there, um, who has somehow ensured that we have all ended up in the right place at the right time, in spite of Brexit, in spite of COVID, in, in, in spite of everything else. So Amanda, huge thanks to you for, for handling the logistics. Um, also, um, thanks to the real experts in this field, um, Dr. Miriam Busaba and Dr. Eve Kolbus, who have put together the conceptual framework and the programme for our discussions. Falls on me just to give a few housekeeping notices at the, front, uh, at the beginning um, and apologies to the online audience um, because these are aimed mainly but not exclusively at those of us in the room. First thing to say is that we are not expecting any fire alarm tests. So if the fire alarms sound, um, then please make your way out of the building, either by the doors at the back or by the fire exit at the side, and we will assemble at the Barbara Hepworth sculpture and await further instructions from the porters there. But hopefully that won't happen. Um, in terms of COVID precautions, for those of you who are here, um, the college's policy at the moment is to ask you to wear face coverings in the public areas, except when you are speaking, eating or drinking or of course, unless you are exempt. Um, for those of you um, in the room um, who are not speakers, please do join us for lunch just by purchasing your food in the main dining hall. Um, tea and coffee um, is being provided this morning and this afternoon, and we hope that everyone here is gonna be able to join for a drinks reception um, in the archive center um, after the, the, the fourth session this afternoon. And there, there will be an opportunity to see the excellent display of diaries and diarists that has been put together by the talented second year history students at Anglia Ruskin University, two of whom joined us in the audience today, um, and also by members of the Archive Centre team. Um, in terms of how we're going to work the panels um, for questions, if you are in the room, there is a mic at the front here that you are welcome to use. So come down to the mic and ask your question there. Or alternatively, raise your hand and um, shout your question and whoever is chairing the session um, will repeat it for the benefit of the online audience. Um, we're not going to be recording the Q&A. We are recording the presentations um, and those we will put up um, in due course. Um, which brings me on to my final point, which is about the UCU strike action. When we planned this conference, we had no idea that it was going to coincide with um, the week of strike action. Churchill College is not part of that action, so no one is crossing a physical or digital picket line by attending this gathering. But we do want to start by recording and showing our support for our striking colleagues. Um, and we're going to do that in two ways. Firstly, um, we're not going to tweet about the conference contents, the contents of the presentations during the strike period. We will put the presentations up online at a later date and we will tweet about them um, at that point. We also respect those colleagues who've taken the very difficult decision not to participate today. Um, and you will have noticed some changes to the final programme. 
um, and to accommodate them and to make sure that their voices are heard and that their hard work recognized, we're going to arrange a second online event in April to allow them to give their papers, but which will also give us a chance to follow up on our discussions. But that's more than enough um, by way of housekeeping. Um, I know you all want to get going. Um, I'm gonna chair the first session in a moment. Um, but before that, we're going to hear, hear from Eve and Miriam. But before then, it gives me enormous pleasure to call upon the master of Churchill College, Professor Dame Feeney Donald, to formally get us started. Feeney. Well, hello everyone, wherever you may be. Um, as you've heard, my name is Athena Donald and I am Master of Churchill College. And it is lovely to see, even if it's only a few people actually physically present after so long, um, certainly this is the first conference I've been able to get to where there are people in the room. And for the speakers, I'm sure that will be hugely beneficial too, because having given endless webinars into a screen where you get no audience reaction at all, having people here, I'm sure will give a, a much more sort of lively feel for the speakers, for the people in the room, and of course, the people on Zoom. As you've heard, this conference has been a long time coming. Um, it was originally planned for this time last year. And we've all been living through interesting, if not absolutely terrifying times. And I do trust you've all been keeping your diaries about them so that the historians of the future will have a record of what you felt, thought and did. The Archive Centre, you've heard from Alan as director, the Archive Centre has a wealth of diaries providing a range of varied perspectives on the past. And there is no doubt that what you write in, in the moment will be very different from what you, you think you thought five years later, let alone 25 or 55 years later. So keeping diaries is really um, a very valuable thing to do. When you go over to the reading rooms of the centre, sort of behind us um, this evening, you'll see a display selected by the students of Anglia Ruskin University, as you've heard, as part of their live briefs project. And some of these will also be available online through the centre's webpage. It's great that we have some of the students here today, um, but I'm also really pleased that we have some of the Archive Centre team too, Amanda, Cherish and Sophie, and I don't know if Amanda's come back. I think she's still outside somewhere. We've already given uh, her our vote of thanks. She really has been hugely influential. But the conference would certainly not have happened without two of the uh, centre's recent researchers. Um, Miriam, who is on the platform, you'll be hearing from shortly, um, from the University of Le Havre in Normandy, and Eve Kolpus, who is somewhere in the ether, um, but you'll also hear from her. Uh, she's from the University of Southampton. Miriam was an overseas fellow here, um, and she here in the college, and she's currently back as part of Cambridge's research and collections visiting scholar scheme. And Eve is a, a former archives by fellow. And the college itself really values this connection with the archives, with these scholars from around the world who come and enrich our lives here in the college as they get to do uh, their research in the archives. But these two in particular have been the driving force for this event, a wonderful Franco-British collaboration, never mind Brexit. Um, so th the conference itself, it's a fantastic lineup in spite of everything that COVID and the war and now I hear the strike are throwing at us. I should just amplify, um, it, the reason Churchill College is not part of the strikes is the local uh, union have made it very clear that their um, struggle, if you like, is with the university system and not with the college system. So all the colleges sit outside the strike. This isn't, you know, we really aren't strike breaking. This is a very explicit um, position from them. Um, so the last two years, yes, we've all been incredibly constrained. Um, it's made life much harder for scholars, the inability to get together, to thrash things through, to talk about um, research and all the rest of it. It's made it so much harder. Um, Zoom 
was wonderful. I say was because I think at the beginning we were just so excited that you could get together at all by these new tools, I mean, Zoom, Teams, whatever. Um, but true scholarship requires discussion, debate, and dialogue, and it benefits from international and interdisciplinary approaches. And here at this conference, um, scholars are coming together from India, North America, Europe, and of course the UK. So some in the room, some virtually, and I hope that dialogue and discussion will really take place. Um, and of course, diaries is the kind of thing that is truly interdisciplinary, yet there are many different ways of approaching the topic and bringing together different perspectives. My hope is that it, this conference encourages networking and collaboration, moves away from the academic isolation that has been imposed on us by the, the um, pandemic, and I look forward to seeing what emerges from the discussions. I'm really sorry, I can't stay. It's week after term, everything seems to have been crammed into this week from my perspective. So I hate doing this, I'm just gonna walk straight out. I'm really sorry, I would love to hear your discussions. I hope you have a wonderful time. And thank you, Miriam and Eve for arranging this. Over to you. Okay, so welcome to all of you. It is a, a great pleasure for me to be back to Churchill College uh, as a co-organizer co of this conference uh, and a great fan actually of Churchill Archive Centers, uh, its collections and its staff. I came here first in 2019 as a French government fellow and discovered one particular collection, uh, William Bull's Diaries, that got me carried away into keeping and making diaries issues. I often discuss them with Eve over lunch, actually. Uh, the following year, I came back as an overseas fellow determined to work long hours in the archive. First, I suffered from a terrible backache, and then I went back home for the first COVID lockdown in France on 16 March 2020. The idea of a conference on keeping and making diary was in our lunch conversation uh, very early. When Eve and I talked to Alan about this, he was immediately keen on the project. Three years later, we finally made it. So we are really happy that this conference is going. This time I've come over as a research and collections visiting professor and should be able to round off the 55 years of keeping diaries between the age of 13 to his death in 1931. Um, I'm talking, of course, of William Bull's diary, offering a wonderful panorama on an in-depth potential of British masculinities before 1914. Based in Hammersmith for most of his life, William Bull lived several lives that he diary kept, if you will forgive me this neologism. He was a multi-diarist, an archivist of his life, and a would-be biographer of his life, of his family, sorry, and himself. With Eve, we realized very quickly that both our diary keepers were only the tips of the iceberg, and that diaries per se should also be our focus. We're happy that the program emphasizes our interest in diaries as much as in diary keepers. And we look forward to a challenging conference and fruitful discussion with all of you. And I think it's over to you, Eve. Thank you, Miriam. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to add a very big welcome to the conference, to all our delegates, all our speakers and all our chairs. Um, my name is Eve Colpus. I'm Associate Professor in British and European History post-1850 at the University of Southampton. Um, it's already been mentioned, I had the privilege of being an Archives by Fellow at Churchill Archive Centre in 2019, um, where serendipity led me to, to this, this meeting uh, with, with Miriam and um, to, to the development of this conference. And I'd just like to thank Alan, Miriam and, and all the team at Churchill for all the enormous amounts of work to bring this conference together. I'm joining you for the conference from my office in Southampton, where it is a nice, lovely, bright morning. Um, and I just want to extend a warm welcome to everybody else who's, who's coming into the conference online. May I begin with one quotation this morning? A pocket-sized diary with a red leather cover measuring four by three inches 
a week to two pages, it allowed enough room for three short sentences per day. On the front, were, on the front is the word Hague. And inside, beside a picture of two bottles, the words Hague, Britain's largest selling Scotch whiskey. Don't be vague, ask for Hague. There follow three or four pages of metric imperial conversion tables, the year's bank holidays, and then a wine chart, the years from 1948 to 1973, each rated as a score of zero to seven for claret, red burgundy, white burgundy, sauterne, champagne and port. And just to remind me where I didn't live, a tube map and then a map of the West End, detailing for me the area between the Thames and Oxford Street where I hardly ever went. These words are from an early chapter in the book, Another Planet, A Teenager in Suburbia, the reminiscences of Tracy Thorne, a singer songwriter and writer about growing up as a teenager in the 1970s and early 1980s in Hertfordshire in England, a county bordering Cambridgeshire to the north, and the quotation I've offered um, is Thorne's description from the vantage point of her in her mid 50s of her first diary that she started to keep aged 13. We're going to hear about many diaries, many diarists um, and many practices of keeping diaries over the course of our conference. Often we will have come to these diaries through wider research interests and professional practices. And my own interest in the history of teenagers and telephones in Britain in the late 20th century led me to Tracy Thorne's diary. The discussions at our conference, however, are really about centering the diary, centering diarists' relationships with the diary and how the historian and archivist approaches diaries. So what does thinking about the format and style of diaries add to our understanding of the genre, its historical meaning and its uses? What and who makes a series of diaries? What does a study of diary production tell us about the individual, the family, institutions, culture? And what spaces do we want to occupy in thinking about the diary as a method and product as well as a text? We hope the next two days will be the start of a series of conversations about these themes and others crossing disciplines, spanning geographies and time periods. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to hand back over to the theatre now for our first panel, The Making of an Archive, which will be chaired by Alan. Okay. Eve, Miriam, thank you both very much. And if I can invite the panelists for the first session, um, so that's Polly, Victoria, and um, Helen to make their way up onto the stage now. Okay, well, our first session this morning is entitled The Making of an Archive. And it's going to look more particularly, of course, at the role that diaries and diarists play in creating archival collections and resources. And of course, this is a huge subject. The Churchill Archive Centre specialises in personal papers, and consequently we have an enormous range of diaries, um, as you will have heard. Some of you will know already that since the beginning of, the Mar of beginning of March, our social media team has been highlighting a different diary from the collections each day in the run-up to this conference. And as I mentioned earlier, we've been working with 20 or so Anglia Ruskin University students on putting together an online exhibition of diaries, which we're going to be launching today, and which those of you at the drinks reception will be able to, to see a taster of later on. Um, I also went this morning on to Archive Search, the web tool by which the Archive Centre makes its catalogues available online. Um, and typing in the word diary revealed that the Archive Centre's catalogued collections contain at least 3,603 entries relating to diaries. Now, of course, these include narrative diaries, engagement diaries, annotated scrapbooks, gardening diaries, drinks diaries, diaries of the young and old, of men and women of different nationalities, different classes, and diaries with radically different styles, approaches, interests and perspectives. Um, this complexity and variety raises some fundamental questions 
which we're now going to attempt to answer on what constitutes a diary. How do you go about collecting, appraising, curating, cataloguing, and providing access to these resources? And how do you understand and interpret the often elusive motivations of the diarist? And I'm lucky that we have three expert panelists to help us get to grips with this subject. As with all our speakers over these two days, their biographies are available to you all already in the programme, which is also available on the website. So I'm not going to give long introductions, um, but suffice it to say that I'm delighted that we have Polly North, um, the founder of the Great Diary Project at the Bishopsgate Institute, um, who is going to set out some of the challenges in dealing with the bewildering variety we encounter when using diaries, and to comment on the approaches we might use to deal with their practical, theoretical, and interpretive complexities. We have Victoria Oxbury, a qualified archivist from Durham County Record Office, who's worked extensively on diaries, particularly those of the First World War, and is going to discuss their research value in providing multiple perspectives. And we have Professor Helen McCarthy from the History Faculty here in Cambridge, um, who is going to summarize some of her work on the diaries of the social reformer, Beatrice Webb, and to comment on what we can learn from the ways in which they've been edited and presented for different publication projects, and what that in turn tells us approach, about approaches to life writing, selfhood, and subjectivity. Um, each speaker has 15 minutes for their presentations, and I think they're all going to speak from the lectern, and then we will regroup over here for Q&A afterwards. So, Polly, if, we're, if you're ready, we'll yeah, start with you. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> and we should introduce our, our youngest delegate, um, Bonnie, yeah. who's accompanying Polly today. Okay. All these diary um, images are from the archive um, that I run. Um, good morning. Um, I run the Great Diary Project. Uh, we're two seemingly disparate things. We're an archive of over 20,000 diaries spanning 400 odd years. And we aspire to be a bit of a powerhouse of thinking about diaries. Um, my co-founder is Dr Irving Finkel um, of the British Museum. Um, so it's fair to say I'm set rather high standards on both accounts. Once I point out that to collect diaries is to curate them, you will immediately see my drift. The Great Diary Project has to decide how to categorise the diaries we receive and how to present them to the world. We have thousands of boxes in our host building at the Bishopsgate Institute. The storeroom is neither dusty nor musty, but it is very quiet. But that belies the fact that within it, there is a host of lives and voices. We can't control this great crowd and we don't want to, but at the very least, we want inquiring readers to be able to find their way to the diaries and the diarists that suit them. Now, such signposting is fascinating. The diary form is notoriously difficult to pin down. Diarists are drawn from all walks of life and are very various in their practice, culture, format, gender identification, sexual preference, politics, period. Though akin, no diaries are quite alike, and, and such a host is a bunch of exceptions, each singularly disproving a rule, and all united by being so different from each other. This complexity, a word Alan used, I thought, of disparity and idiosyncrasies can thwart attempts to standardise the genre and its um, nomenclature. As such, diaries have often been misunderstood, mislabeled and marginalised by archivists and academics. I argue that diary writing, especially at its most mercurial and autocratic, is a golden opportunity for archivists and academics rather than a problem. Handling this looseness requires its own rigour and disciplines. Thinking about diary writing can push anyone to thoughtfulness to re-evaluations of archival status quo and modus operandi, and can inspire new theoretical and archival approaches. Secondly, and further to the previous issue, diaries are equally and literally various in their accessibility and readability. Many are not digitized, others are destroyed, misplaced, hidden, damaged, coded, or so illegible they cannot be read. Some of these practical, di practical difficulties can be overcome, but this often requires resources that archives do not have. Thirdly, the personal nature of diaries makes them a bit of an archival hot potato. 
archivists especially, but critics too, must meet a range of moral duties to the diarist, to third parties, to the, depos to the depositor. Archivists may also have to consider warning readers of potentially offensive material. However, with forethought and strong protocols, a balance can be struck between the rights and privacies of diarists and the access and or re reproduction requirements of publishers and researchers. Our final point is to our first and is that archival triage still too often enshrines value judgments that have traditionally missed the significance of diaries. Many of these archival value judgments have been developed alongside and are characterized by academic and cultural milieu. Each generation of archivist and academic is liable to treat the subject of diary writing according to prevailing academic fashion. Starting with a focus on the diary's treatment as an historical resource, I would now like to summarize the diary form's journey from outsider to academic and archival gem. Um, obviously there's pockets of people who love diaries throughout history. It's just a sort of sweeping generalization, but it, it does draw a general picture. And we'll observe some crossover between the practical and theoretical implications of handling diaries. For example, an archivist may wonder whether a diary should be categorised as to its location on a shelf or its catalogue description as being, say, honest or introspective. These are criteria which are just as germane to the academic who analyses the degree to which a diarist can, in theory, be honest or usefully introspective in representing the many facets of their experience. In the mid 19th century, a growing band of published diarists were increasingly read for pleasure and as a learning opportunity. Obviously, peeps stands out. During the same period, but less widely and virtually unstudied, the diaries of the everyman were being published by special interest journals, um, including Sussex archaeological collections and the antiquary. These include workmen's diaries uh, and lots of clerics' diaries, and you have to root around to find these journal entries. They're quite interesting. Um, these diaries were distributed as a curios and as an extension of the archaeological, historical and geographical record. More often than not, historians, biographers and literary critics were interested in diaries as supplementary research documents. European and North American academic interest in diaries started in earnest in the 1970s. This may in part be due to the diary form's ability to draw out critical theories popularised during this period. So there was a real peak in interest in the 1970s in, in general academia. Whereas before, I think interest tended to be pockets. Um, as I mentioned, until this time, the diary form, if it was considered at all, was treated by serious academics as something of an adjunct. A reason for this is that traditional frames of reference did not recognize the aesthetic qualities particular to the diary and, disrupt and were disrupted by the form's challenges to standardization. Further to this, I argue that the diary forms, modus operandi and styles were incompatible, incompatible with the standard discursive strategies many academics were invested in. In short, diaries touch on profound matters, but few diarists set out to be theoretical in a way a typical academic might be familiar with. Early academic and archival disdain for, or indifference to diary writing, was further fueled by a post-Puritan, post-romantic prejudice that the form was sentimental, self-absorbed and confessional. Though many men kept diaries, it was considered a practice deployed by the weaker sex, that is, women. Clearly, there is something in the practice of writing a diary that can go way beyond it being merely sentimental or casual. My favourite example is the value, value Ludwig Wittgenstein placed on aspects of his diary practice. Far from being a form at odds with his serious academic work, Wittgenstein deployed the diary form, um, and uh, Dr. Gawley has written it very well on this very recently. Far from being a form at odds with serious academic work, Wittgenstein deployed the diary form to complement and meet at least some of both his intellectual and personal needs. He did so long before life writing became a popular academic resource. Diary writing enabled Wittgenstein to articulate as best he could what he was deeply aware of, but only half saw. What have been the perceived inadequacies of the form are now often seen as virtues, a point which is well made by Margareta Jolly um, in her chapter, Memory, Narrative and Histories. The diary will almost always be in a vital and fundamental sense personal, even a boring appointment diary or boring in quotation marks because they rarely are boring. Um, 
is, is personal. It, it, it shows you what that person wanted to write down. <laughs> it might be impersonal, but you get a picture of what they thought was important about that day. This characteristic enriches diaries critical potential. When we look into the heart of the personal, we often touch on profound yet inveterately ambiguous ideas, including what it is to discern, verify and describe the nature and content of our human experience. This exploration is about the ways in which we handle our epistemological and ontological constructs. This is in part because attending to the inner world and the personal is a constant reminder that the subjects trying to discover these truths are always as self-verifiers marking their own homework, however hard they seek objectivity and solid ground. The diary raises questions around facticity, authenticity and reliability. It is often presumed to be, or presumes itself to be, non-fiction, and yet often enters fiction's purview. It's a moot point where a diary is or can be both a factual and objective or subjective account of a historical event. Before the 1960s or 70s, academics usually took the diary narrator, their ontological makeup and epistemological prowess as at least capable of being more or less stable. The historical inaccuracy, the reliability and representativeness of the diary were seen as dependent on the diarist's desire to tell the truth and not her ability to distinguish it. There is some respect amongst early scholars of diary for the ability of humanist man to know, to know, material, to, to know material reality and to know the truth of himself. By the 1970s, postmodernist disruptions to claims for absolutists essentialist, etc., epistemological and ontological models were well embedded. Of course, from the skeptics to the existentialist, doubts is a mask as to the nature and content of human experience. However, the postmodern's particular breed of doubt is distinct, if only as a product of its time. For life writing scholars, much of this boils down to the question, do we own our own capital V voice? And this is important in diaries because all you hear is voices. Or are we ciphers and proxies for society and our material makeup? The work of Jacques Derrida, Helen Sissou, Roland Barthes, and Stanley Fish on life writing illustrates the tension between the impulse to attend to and write about one's experiences and perceptions, and the postmodern disavowals of life writing genres and subjects. Postmodernists are both attracted and repelled by the diary. It's my view that the humanist qualities are not always properly acknowledged by diary critics, including Derrida et al, and have been somewhat weakened or mishandled by late, late, sorry, mid late 20th century critical approaches. According to postmodern strictures, such as those of Bakhtin, diarist voices are cultural, linguistic or historical constructs and polyvocal heteroglossia. But this view defies our sense that each person is also the result of an almost infinitely complex set of constructions, not merely those of grammar or hegemonic opinion. They are in effect, and in a quite humanist way, unique and can be accorded the status this description entails. Neither camp, humanist or postmodern, can claim to be right when it comes to ideas around agency and consciousness or searching out stable epistemological tax. Such processes and ideas are clearly not open and such shut. Diary writing, as an expression reminds us that interiority cannot be wholly regimented. Diary as witness speaks to our intuition that perceptions, memories and experiences are not, perhaps cannot be, considered wholly accurate renditions of whatever we define reality to be. Life outpaces notation and approaches to it. However, the witness remains standing and speaking and with careful navigation, elusive topics can become beguilingly fruitful. They challenge us to flex our critical approaches. In the past 20 years, Patricia Mayer Spatz, Claire Brandt, Kimberly Dark, Lauren Ballant, Stanley Fish, uh, Kenneth Plummer, Margaret Dolly and others, many others have at times and to varying degrees made room for ambiguity, particularly as they handle life writing. This is not so much a, much a matter of theory light, but theory nimble or flexible. And these critics set exploration ahead of a desire for critical tidiness. Their approaches at their most ambitious find room for humanist values and meaning in a postmodern world. At their least ambitious, these approaches are free to accept some meanings, are felt deeply and draw our attention and it can affect the way we act and interact. 
The history of self-reflective writing started as early as 4,000 years ago. Even if great distances of time or place or both separate the writer from the reader, a diary seems to be capable of appearing at once alien and familiar. As much as things, people and theories are subject to change, diarists of every period seem intelligible and interesting to everyone coming after. This brings us to the idea that diarist outpourings and our analysis of them importantly contain and continue a liveliness that seems to outrun as well as inspire interpretation. Such liveliness is as sustaining as it is elusive. It is a territory that requires navigating as it underpins the personal, moral, political and cultural frameworks we build. I, I'm going to skip a bit because I think that I might need to... <laughs> But I'll just, I'll just sum up by saying there's no single and perfectly proper way to read a diary or write it, let alone critique it. Um, there's no simple and perfect guide to the categorization of diaries in archives. Above all, my years of diary obsession, which um, I've been archiving them for about 15, 20 years now, have taught me to try to be light on my feet and pragmatic rather than dogmatic. I love the idea of a theory of everything, but the diary's fabulous variety pricks such presumption at every turn. So I, ho I hope you uh, heard some of the last bit and enjoyed the pictures. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for a wonderful in introduction and then um, gets us started. And if I can ask um, Victoria to take the lecture now. Hi, um, my name's Victoria Oxbury and I'm a project archivist at Durham County Record Office. The biggest project I've worked on was Durham at War, our five year First World War commemoration project. And I'm now working on the Durham Light Infantry Archive through an Archives Revealed grant. I mention it because it is through this that I've worked closely with diaries and many of the examples I'll be using come from here. I'll refer to the Durham Light Infantry as the DLI. In a review for Russell T. Davis' television series, It's a Sin, Spencer Cornhaber wrote in The Atlantic in March last year that it offers a simple yet potent reminder that history is not a Wikipedia page, but real people's lives and deaths. And this is what I think diaries do. Diaries are a primary empirical source of a time and place, yet they're inherently biased to the experiences and values of the writer Having a variety of these perspectives helps us to look back at history and see it not as one thing, but the rich, complicated jumble that we know our world to be. Local archives can be a great source of these. At Durham County Record Office, we have over 1,300 volumes of diaries, over 250 collections. The success of the Durham at War project was in large part down to the personal story approach where possible, using the words of people themselves. You can read about casualty figures and offensive strategies, but reading the diary of someone who was there provides a very different point of view of what was happening. It makes history accessible and relatable, and it humanizes it. Most people can't empathize with how it feels to be in a prisoner of war camp, but we might be able to share a sense of humor. Captain Percy Lyon of 6th Battalion DLI wrote whilst in a POW camp on 21st of July 1918. We are getting quite attached to the two German orderlies in our tin room. One is the very image of the carpenter in Through the Looking Glass, the other who somehow got called Tweedledum. Even when in the midst of a significant event such as a war or a pandemic, it is through the mundane everyday experiences often recorded in diaries that the effects are seen. The changes in the way we traveled, the fact that we stopped traveling, how going to the supermarket became a different experience. For social fu future social historians in particular, it is these small personal snapshots that reveal the most. A common thread in the record office educational outreach is what was life like for them. How we relate to events in diaries can also change with time. In 2019, I copied an extract of Michael Hebert's 1939 diary, 
a DLI soldier whose diaries at the Bishop's Gate Institute as part of the Great Diary Project. At the time, it was just context to what I was actually interested in. Returning to it two years later, it took on a new resonance. He wrote, I feel a little bit lonely, a little bit lazy, a little bit apprehensive. I find a certain urge to meet people and talk, even just to see them and nod. It can also be surprising the kind of diaries you find, even in a local authority archive. In 2021, Durham County Record Office received a donation of four diaries belonging to Peggy Brown, a girl born in Lewisham, but who grew up in the Northeast after her widowed mother remarried. The diaries cover 1933 to 1937, with 1934 missing. In 1933, Peggy was 18 and living in stockton on tees where her stepfather was a vicar. However, Peggy doesn't spend much of that year in Stockton, but instead goes to stay with a, with a mother and daughter who run a boarding house in Dresden from early January till October. We know that 1933 was a key year in German and world history. It was when Adolf Hitler came to power, but an 18 year old from Teesside, finding herself alone abroad for the first time with no knowledge of what was to follow, gives a pretty unique perspective on what is happening around her. Peggy buys some British and American newspapers and refers to political discussions, but it is not clear where her thoughts lie on that matter. However, it is quite clear that she is taken by the pageantry and spectacle of the, that the Nazi party provided. The following are two extracts from Peggy's diary. 9th of March, 1933. Walked to bridge by Schlossstrasse. Great excitement. Crowds gathering at end of bridge, waiting for an expected Nazi procession at 6.30. Now 4.30. I waited one and a half hours in which time the police with rifles tried to get crowds to go home. They didn't. Small processions of Nazis passed and the soldiers and Red Cross men. But I had to go, by, I had to go home by 6 p.m. in case Frau Werner was worried but I was furious when I found out she didn't return for another hour. Heard afterwards that it was a large procession, great excitement. Communists fired from roofs and killed one Nazi. 1st of May, 1933. Streets full of people for the great occasion, no one in to do any work. The flags are a sight to behold. Hitler's red flag with a swastika on a circular white background and the national flag with three stripes, black, white and red sometimes with the eagle in the middle, sometimes the swastika. When the car arrived, we all four got in. I at the front with the man and went for a motor drive out into the country. Had a long walk with two rests in which Frau Werner behaved just like the fussiest of old ladies, carrying a rug the whole way for the day to lie on. We got back and had tea at the hotel at about 4 p.m. We then took the car back again. On arrival near the Grossergarten, found the whole place blocked by processions so Frau Werner and I got out and walked. I then left her and entered the crowd and took some photographs. Unfortunately, we don't have any of those photographs in the diaries. The broader picture of events can't be encapsulated in official narratives. Varied personal experiences hold even more weight if the official narratives have been skewed by what they are allowed to say. I couldn't tell you for sure as I have not read the 109 volumes but I wouldn't expect the history of the Great War based on official documents by direction of the Committee of Imperial Defense to tell us as Colonel Hubert Morant, former DLI did in October, 1918, that the assaulting troops were to trickle down to the river cell, which was reported to be five to eight feet deep and 30 to 50 feet wide. Divisional commander said bridging material would be dumped behind the wood during the night under the chief Royal Engineer's orders. To make certain, I called up the CRE and he said no bridging was contemplated as far as he knew. I then called the general staff officer. He said no bridging was required. The cell was only three feet wide. I want to take the idea of perspectives a step further and talk about plural perspectives. What can be more rich than reading the personal diary of someone at a particular time than reading several different ones? I want to, to provide an example of these from our collections at the Record Office. The Durham at War project saw many of our First World War diaries transcribed, 
so I was able to find some that covered the same date. I also looked in some other collections and I have five sources for the 27th of May, 1918. Some are very short and some are very long. For these, I have taken extracts. The first two examples are from military personnel serving on the Western Front. The next is a school logbook and the final two are civilians. This is the longest entry. Although I've taken extracts, this is still lengthy as I wanted it to be true to the experiences of the writer. Captain Percy Hugh Beverly Lyon, commanding a company of six battalion Durham Light Infantry in the vicinity of the Shadard and Cryon, France. At 1 a.m. exactly came the beginning of the German bombardment following the fire of our guns as a roar of applause follows a single speaker, drowning and obliterating it in a moment. The concussion was considerable, lasted without cessation or diminution for three hours. I decided it was time to move and took my, out my company. When I came out into the open, I found to my dismay and surprise, files of Germans immediately to our front and level with our line on the right. A few tanks had broken through and were by now well behind us. The defense seems to have crumpled up completely. The intense bombardment, heavy beyond all precedent, had split the line into small isolated groups of sadly shaken men who fell an easy prey to the first German line. A large number must have surrendered without any resistance. I decided to get back while I could and withdrew my men as fast as possible. Retirement now meant going through the barrage from front to rear with small hope about stripping it. My men dropped off as were hit and by the time I had got through to our HQ, I was practically alone. I at once found the commanding officer. It was obvious that our front was broken. His idea was to, read, to reach Brigade HQ and see what information they could give him. After some time, we met a company of the 5th Battalion coming up from the reserve area, and I offered to attach myself with all available men, about 20. They had orders to hold the emergency line further forward, and so the CO sent me with them. The front of the company had reached the top of the hill to find us already in the enemy's possession. By now, I saw Germans all around the hill, and looking up, I saw half a dozen of them 10 yards away, shouting and raising their rifles. The wounded men were shouting at me to surrender, and indeed I saw nothing else for it. So I just stood up in a minute, we were prisoners. The Germans were all around us in a moment, pulling at our equipment. My glasses went at once, also my revolver. The speed and method of the advance. Nowhere did I see the slightest confusion or hurry, filled us with a despairing admi admiration. I certainly am prepared to regard the preparation and execution of the whole attack as one of the best things an army has ever done. Our guard was a good fellow, young with spectacles who talked to me in French. He was full of suggestions for carrying the wounded, but his distinct orders to bring with them the column. C'est la guerre, he said, by way of consolation. At one place we halted and a German officer chatted with us in quite passable English. He said he'd been a waiter at the Piccadilly Hotel and was very fond of London. We moved on faster. I had sufficient to occupy my thoughts to make me forget my hunger, but my thirst was becoming insistent. But throughout, my two dominant feelings were bitter indignation at my position and still more remorse for the terrible anxiety my people would feel until they knew I was a prisoner. It seemed to me that the punishment was falling on them for my misadventure. Also in the Shadard and Crayon area of France was acting Captain Henry Wilkinson, commanding a company of the 8th Battalion DLI. Punctually at 1 a.m., just as Williams and I were finishing a meal, the barrage came down. It consisted of every known kind of shell, gas included, and the first shell of all made havoc of the entrance to our elephant shelter, tearing away the gas, the gas proof curtain so recently erected with pride by the Royal Engineers. At 4 a.m., the attack must have commenced, for the barrage began to slowly creep towards us. At 5.15 a.m., it passed us, leaving, in peace, leaving us in peace and in ignorance of what had happened to our thinly managed front and support lines. We were not long in doubt. The advance of the Bosch in liberal open order told its own tale. At Company HQ, we collected our few men, and together with Harrison and a few remnants of the front line, 
attempted to delay matters. Harrison, the battalion's best subaltern, was unfortunately killed in this fight. Shortly afterwards, we effected an undignified retreat, retreat under the heavy machine gun fire and rifle fire. On reaching battalion HQ, I ordered the rest to go on and looked around. Not a soul in sight anywhere. I made haste to follow the others. Unfortunately, the path they had taken was now under heavy enfilading fire, so I was forced to strike through the wood itself. When I eventually reached the light railway, which I intended to follow, I ran headlong into a party of five Bosch. Resistance was hopeless. The usual procedure was followed and I was quickly deprived of all my kit, including pocketbook, diary, tobacco, whiskey, etc. I noticed that they had unsuccessfully attempted to use our tanks. There were very few dead, but a party of Bosch were already stripping the fallen of all serviceable clothing and boots. Late at night, we were given our first food. I had tasted nothing since 1 a.m., which consisted of a very little watery soup. Having no utensils, we were forced to drink this out of old rusty tins and dirty bottles, which were found to be found all over. Eventually, we retired to rest on the stone floor of a long used, disused, filthy, broken down house. Tired, miserable, dirty, and hungry, we thus ended the first day in captivity. This is from Barnard Castle Church of England Boys' School Logbook. Walter Rutter was admitted to and in attendance at the council school last week. The number on the, att the attendance register and in the summary has therefore been altered for the week. First class at garden today from two to four. G. Taylor, a watchmaker from Gameford, went to Col Col Calton and Aldborough to repair clocks for Mr. Lax and Mr. Fenwick. Esme Simpson of Wrighton went out. The rest of my chickens had hatched. Went to Newcastle by tram with, the, with Iris. I went to the Red Cross depot in the morning. Dodo and Vera came in later, so joined them for lunch at Copson's. Then I went back to the depot. Iris came home by the 2.20. I came home and the others by the 3.50. Went out up to the farmyard in the evening. And Clara Rill, nice fine day wrote to Rupert's little just before I went to bed. I find it quite hard to wrap my head around the fact that these all happened on the same day, but these are all perspectives at the same specific point in time. In an article appearing in the Chicago Tribune online, April 2020, a high school teacher said, in history, one of the priorities is evaluating primary sources. When COVID-19 started happening, we realise someday students are going to be researching this and they're going to be looking for primary sources too. It's often thought that archives just contain old things. But as we come to the end of the talk, I want to remind you that these diaries weren't always historical. If we don't collect new things, then we won't have anything old for the future. <laughs>